So I'm really all for regulation and I'm excited about that. The industry is a free for all right now. When I interview people, people come in with quote unquote certificates and some of them literally can't hold a sentence together and others of them are total pros. And so there's no quality standard whatsoever in the industry right now. And the general quality and the general working knowledge is piss poor. It's so, so shockingly bad that I'm really excited about uh, new standards. I'm excited about um, a, bar- a much bigger barrier to entry. Becoming a yoga teacher now is something that people do. They sort of take a trip to Bali and become a yoga teacher and then they go back to work. And it, it, it kind of makes the whole industry a little bit silly. You don't find this in Pilates. You don't find this in personal training. Even even these industries, which are less regulated, are still taken a lot more seriously than yoga teachers. That's Lucas Rockwood, and this is episode nine of the Yoga Life podcast. Hello, and welcome back. This is Kevin. Today is a bit of a surreal one for me. I have Lucas Rockwood on the show, who is a well, he's the daddy of yoga podcasts. He was the first person to that I know of to start a podcast uh, around yoga. And he's been an invaluable resource to me and many yoga teachers throughout the world. He specializes in business uh, yoga mastery. And um, he's a serial entrepreneur. Entrepreneur? Entrepreneur. He's a serial businessman. <laughs> the more you say that word, the weirder it sounds. Um, so I hope you enjoy the podcast. It's a, a short and sweet one and uh, packed with information. And what I love about Lucas is he's not afraid to say what he feels. And he's really on the cutting edge of what's next in the industry. So hope you enjoy. If you do, as always, please leave a review on Stitcher or on iTunes. That really helps the podcast and allows me to do more episodes. Thanks. Hey, Lucas, how's it going? Really good. Thanks for thanks for having me, Kevin. Yeah, thank you. Um, it's surreal to be speaking to you because um, your podcast was the first yoga podcast I ever came across a couple of years ago. And um, then I it was between yourself and then I started listening to Yoga Land. But uh, you were most definitely the, the pioneer for me. Um, I remember a, a peer of mine, another teacher, uh, recommended your, your podcast and I was... Uh, I didn't realize there were yoga podcasts so <laughs> so um yeah it's what what struck me by it was um how professional it, it was so um um so thanks for the inspiration I'll start by saying that and um how how do you I, that's actually something I wanted to talk to you about actually is um how you started your podcast and how you grew it to be where it is now yeah, it was kind of an accidental thing with timing. I never uh planned to be a podcaster, never had any intention. I just had some customer service problems. I was getting more inquiries than I could answer. And uh, when people write me messages, I always want to respond. I just think that's kind of my role as a a yoga teacher and a trainer. So I started having my support team compile questions, and I started doing this weekly Q&A show. And I don't know exactly when this was. I think this was 2012, 2013, something like that. And I just started doing 10-minute Q&A shows. Sometimes it would be 20 minutes, depending on how many calls I had. And I would just kind of plow through those. And people started to respond to it, and people started to listen to it. This wasn't the first wave of podcasting. It was kind of during a a dark period. There was the initial boom of podcasting in 2006, 2007, Mm -hmm. something like that. But when I started, it was before Serial came out. It It was before, it was kind of during a lull time. There were weird cultish people like me listening to audio but there it wasn't it, it was pre-serial which is kind of a big change for a lot of podcasters and so i was just i was just doing it i didn't have any agenda at all and people were listening and so then i kind of fused two things i'd been doing these online webinars web classes just free classes that i did for for my subscribers for a number of years with random mm-hmm. people and i realized that i could kind of merge the two formats and use a q a format an interview format, which I had already been doing, and it would give me a, a good reason to talk to to talk to smart people and learn new things every week. And so we just started doing that. And I I, I guess we just committed to a once a week schedule. And I, I guess that was um, six years ago, something like that. And uh, and off we've gone. No no real agenda, no big plan. I know right now podcasting is sort of like a business strategy for people, and and you know they're building a media brand or whatever they're doing. And I, I totally applaud that. I, I never had that kind of foresight. I was just kind of uh, talking to smart people and answering questions from my audience, and it's turned into something that's been uh, really really effective and really rewarding. 
It's yeah, because that it, I think to do a podcast, it, it does take a lot of work. There's a lot of competition. Anyone can start an Instagram account; it takes a second. But to actually start a good quality podcast with good audio, intro music, um, to secure sponsors, to make it sound as professional as it can be, it takes a lot of effort. I do everything myself, and um, but the good thing about that is there's not as much competition in this space in this long form content space how would you say in the last six years for you um the uh, like you said podcast industry has become more of a business but for you is it are you glad you started it is it how, how's it helped your business would you say you know you know i never paid any attention at all i had no business agenda for it and i never even thought about doing anything I, it was just a side project that i really enjoyed doing it was kind of the the one random thing that i did with no agenda in my business and i would say probably in the yeah. in the past 2 years i've really noticed that it is actually a really strong builder of business and really the way that it does that is through really deep connections with listeners with community and so you know my listeners end up coming to do retreats or courses with me my listeners end up being customers uh, my listeners end up you know getting involved with us so we've even had we've even employed people who've listened to the show and so it's really interesting because in the in the internet world right now where most people are going for breadth podcasting is really about depth and so any podcast audience relative to any social media account or viral video, any of them, the listenership is relatively small. But the connections that you make with people when they listen to you for 30 minutes, 60 minutes, a week, whatever it is, it's really, really deep connections. And so it's been really interesting. And so it's definitely turned into something that uh, I think of in terms of, you know, part of part of my business portfolio. But I still don't I still don't attempt to have any kind of ROI on it. I don't have any kind of agenda with it. It's just something I do mainly selfishly so I can learn stuff and then it's been kind of a happy accident that people that people enjoy it and listen to it and learn from it and it's been growing uh growing really steadily especially since this shift in podcasting since podcasting got into especially in the U.S. podcasts end up in cars the Spotify move with podcasts really gave a big boost in listenership it became a little bit easier the the discoverability and tech around podcasting has both been a, a curse and a blessing. A curse because it's just very difficult for anybody to find anything, but uh, kind of a blessing because when people do find things, they tend to be really loyal. You know, I have shows that I've listened to for four or five years, and I don't have any blog or online media that I've consumed that long. So it's a it's an interesting medium for sure. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's funny how it's so intimate as well. I was in India about three months ago, and I had a, to be honest, I had a terrible time. I had a really I. I I had a really bad experience. Uh, I found it very difficult traveling around there and just living there. Um, and it's funny how uh, if I listen to the Joe Rogan podcast and your podcast, then when you hear a familiar voice, uh, something like it keeps you company during like, you know, eight hours waiting in an airport. So that you, you build a, a way, as you said, a way deeper relationship than you would with an Instagram post, I feel. Um, so uh, I, I'm I'm glad that I, I've started this 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 podcasting, but I'm unsure f- for me now because I'm six episodes in, which probably I know is very little. But I am thinking about how to monetize it because it's it's taking me. I'd say I probably spend ten eleven hours a week um, doing editing, doing all the artwork, obviously recording as well. Um, so the next stage for me is how to monetize. I've been looking at different options like Patreon, for example. Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar, yeah, familiar with Patreon. Um, what's your, I know you, say you don't have a strategy in terms of um, networking, but in terms of your sponsors, how did, how did you make that happen, uh, securing the sponsors that you did? You know, I don't really remember. Someone just contacted us initially and wanted to sponsor the show. And so um, we sold a sponsorship and then we sold another one. It's kind of a self-fulfilling thing. You know, once you get one, you get more. But uh, no no real strategy, no real plan. My biggest suggestion to you or anyone else doing podcasting is you just have to really realize it's a long game. Um, Audio just doesn't explode. You know, shows like NPR stuff and things like Serial, these are total anomalies. Most stuff, it's a long, slow burn, and it takes a very long time before you'll have any kind of revenue opportunity. And I would even say, like, if you're looking to have it do anything significant, it might be a mistake in the same way that starting an Instagram account or starting any kind of social media communication channel as a primary way to 
make money is pretty risky. It, it can work out, and sometimes it'll work out, but it's usually a real long game. You know, the people I know who are, are on social media who are making money, most of them, they start making money three, five years in. It's pretty rare that somebody hits the ground running, and it just, just takes a while to build an audience. Um, there's definitely exceptions to that. I know people who, for whatever reason, they have a really polarizing message, or they have uh, you know, a story or something that really just, just takes off, and you know, in a few months, they're, they're off and running. But um, for the most part, I think it's a, a, a long game, and I think, it, I think it, it would make a lot more sense to figure out a different place for, for your bread and butter to come from rather than trying to monetize this form of media. It's, it's a difficult one, especially initially. Okay, yeah, that's, that's solid advice. Um, do you, in terms of uh, the next stage for your podcast, uh, do you, would you think about maybe incorporating more video or any any anything like that in terms of uh, evolving it? I mean, it's great, it's, it's fantastic how it is, but do you see anything on the cusp that maybe next that you're interested in getting involved in, like like video podcasting? You know, I've experimented with video. I produce a lot of video. The, the it's been said that audio is like the perfect media. You know, better than print, better than than video. And I think there's there's some truth to that. The challenge with print is just to get a 500 or 1,000 word article out. The amount of revision and editing needed to get something that's even grammatically passable is really laborious. Whereas with speech, you can forgive all of the small errors and the ums and ahs that you and I make during this call. So it's a great medium it's really easy to edit editing processing video video files are heavy they're clunky lighting is bad people look old it's really a challenging medium to work <laughs> in so i do a lot of video and video of course is the most popular medium by far right now on any channel online is really the internet's really turning into tv more than anything but i don't have any intention to do video podcast you know if you look at kind of the history of audio howard stern very famously put his show on video and I don't know how many years they did that decade over a decade I think and that was a, a an interesting move I always found it extremely boring uh, Joe Rogan's on video I find his videos super boring um, you know Bulletproof Radio does online stuff Tim Ferriss does online video stuff I don't for me there's no intrinsic value and the friction and the added the added uh, hassle of doing it for me aren't worth it um, I guess there are some exceptions to that like Marie Forleo for example has a very very successful video series and it's still for me the the barrier to entry and the friction and the amount of time I'd have to spend doing things that add no value to my listeners like working on light and sound and organizing in-person interviews and I don't I I think I can add way more value by doubling down on on trying to get better and better as an interviewer and trying to get better and better with my content than trying to make video which I for, for a talk based show which is what I do there's nothing intrinsically visual about it I think uh, I think it's a great medium so my plan is for sure to stick to audio and just to uh, try to improve the the quality of my guests and the quality of my interviews that's really really my focus but the structure that I have has been working for quite quite a while we do a relatively short form show most shows tend to push an hour and our show tends to clock in 30 to 45 minutes somewhere in there so we try to keep things short and succinct and uh, not so talky and casual and this is just i guess a personal personal preference of mine i find a lot of a lot of podcasts it's you know as the as the as the show develops it becomes very much the host or the hosts chatting with each other about their their life which i don't find so interesting i'm I'm always just trying to learn stuff yeah yeah no absolutely it's i think um there's like you're trying to learn stuff and you're meeting guests that um, add value and someone like joe rogan he's just um, gone for something completely different but um yeah there's there's a market for both i suppose um so you you do a lot like (laughs) you have in your website is packed with different business ventures and and uh uh, parts of your of um of your business that you have going on but one thing i was particularly interested in was um trapeze or yoga trapeze and um i was wondering what's like how how you developed why you decided to develop um the trapeze training and why it's so popular because we don't have that here in Dublin Ireland yeah we've got um I think we have about five or seven Irish teachers now so there are a couple of teachers around but we don't have any there's no dedicated studios but uh we're the largest manufacturer of of yoga inversion devices in the world by a factor of about 10 so we make more yoga trapeze or similar devices than really anyone out there and we did so for many years 
And really, we just had so many clients emailing us, contacting us every day saying, hey, can you do a training? Can you, can you get a teacher here? Can you get somebody to do it? And I tried to partner with people for a couple of years. There were a couple other people out there training. But like a lot of things in the yoga market, the teachers weren't really organized. They weren't really professional. They didn't have a manual. They didn't, it just wasn't really something that I could offer. And so inevitably, we started developing our own course. I have three studios also, so we developed it internally to do our own t- internal training as well. And then uh, we put up the course, and it was just a, a huge success. So we've been going for a couple of years now, and we have over 300 teachers already. I think uh, 2019, I think we'll probably train another three or 500 teachers, so it's, it's really going great. Okay. Yeah. It's, it's, so you have Irish teachers, but they're just not based in Ireland, or they are based here. They just don't have a studio. We have uh, we have at least five, I think, seven different teachers in Ireland who are teaching. We've got a couple of guys up in Limerick. Uh, I know we have somebody in Dublin, um, or, or close to okay. it anyway. We yeah, had no dedicated studios. Okay. Um, yeah. And, and as well as th- that, you have um, absolute yoga academy you also have yoga body natural uh, and you have the yoga body fitness um what i'd like to just um i was curious um about yoga body fitness and that business model because uh, most yoga teachers they get paid per class and um, they're they're independent contractors but uh, um, on your website you mentioned that you your business model for yoga body fitness is slightly different um i was just interested to learn more about that you know, I'm a I'm a yoga teacher by trade. I don't um, I don't really have. I mean, I've obviously developed a few other skills along the way, but I'm I'm just a yoga teacher. And one of the things that frustrated yeah. me when I was teaching yoga is it's really not a very sustainable lifestyle. You work not just mornings, but you also work evenings and you also work weekends. So, like a you know typical schedule, you teach a seven or eight a.m. class, you have a break in the middle of the day, and then you go back and teach two classes in the evening, and you work on weekends, and you work six days a week. You never have a day off. You sprain your ankle. You're unemployed. So there's a whole bunch of things about yoga teaching that are just fundamentally broken and sort of abusive. You have this really relatively affluent customer base, and then you have these sort of starving, struggling teachers, and um, it just fundamentally didn't sit well with me, so I wanted to figure out a way to, to correct that. So we developed a different business model. We hire our teachers on salary, and they have fixed schedules, and they have maternity leave, and they have vacation days. They have a, a normal life. Mm-hmm. They can live a normal life. And so it's, w- what that means is we have the most desirable yoga jobs in the city. A lot, a lot more desirable. So, you know, we'll do a, when, whenever we're hiring, we'll get 50 or 75 people applying for a job. Just a much better place to work. Um, there's challenges that come along with that, but I just think that the industry has to change. You can't, you can't build an industry off of, you know, this totally unsustainable lifestyle for employees. And, and, um, yeah, because I think that that is one one of the reasons. Well, I know that's one of the reasons why I've started other ventures. Apart, I mean, I do enjoy them, but in the back of my mind, I think that I'd like multiple revenue streams if I could. Ideally, um, maybe not today, maybe not tomorrow, but someday. Because you never know. You don't feel like you have much job security sometimes, as as you said. If you injure yourself, then um, it's going to be really tough for you to make it all around driving all around the city teaching classes at all hours of the day um so that's that's really interesting that you've employed that that business model i can see a lot of value in that and hopefully that that comes to ireland um the other business ventures you you have um absolute uh, sorry um yoga yoga body natural so is this um how did you develop these these products it was it you had the idea for the ingredients and then you um you uh, find someone to manufacture them or how did that come about so i started manufacturing nutritional supplements in 2007 so quite a while ago and i Mm -hmm. was into nutrition health and wellness long before i was into yoga so it's kind of been a lifelong project for me in terms of developing nutritional supplements people always have this question like are you a medical doctor are you a chemist and the answer is no and the way that things get manufactured in nutritional supplements is more similar to food manufacturing than it is to pharmaceutical manufacturing, depending on what kinds of things you're making. For the things that I'm making, it's more similar to food manufacturing. So you don't need to be a, a biochemist and you don't need to be a medical doctor. When you think of something like ascorbic acid, which is vitamin C, and you go to a country like North America, 
the the production, the regulation, the the formulation of ascorbic acid is very, very, very tightly controlled. It's similar to buying bulk cane sugar or something like that. And so it's possible for somebody with uh, motivation and interest to source and effectively put together nutritional supplements were you so inclined. Now, this is not a business I would recommend to most people because it's no longer in dem- as in demand as it used to be. So when I first started, I, I, at one point I had 12 or 15 different nutritional supplements, green juice blends and protein powders and all kinds of different things. And over the years, I've just uh, throttled back to the things that people really can't find in their local health food stores. But depending on where you live in the world, most people are getting more and more access to stuff. It used to be that there was just very limited supply. Now, it's still true in some places, like I live here in Spain, and we have almost nothing. You can't even get vitamin D in the, in the pharmacy. It's ridiculous. But in, in, in North America, I'll go to the U.S., and you go to any random pharmacy, and they have really, really excellent, high-quality nutritional supplements from pretty much any type of thing you want to find. And so it's become a pretty competitive business. And this is a good thing because I I got into the business to to help people find stuff that they needed. And so that's a good thing. There's a lot of options. Prices are lower. People can get stuff quickly. But um, yeah, so I wanted to make a nutritional supplement for yoga. I was taking a big stack of stuff myself just because I've been a nutritional nerd for a long time. A couple of things that I was taking, one of them is methyl sulfonylmethane. It tastes horrible. It just sort of makes your whole face cringe up. And I could only get it in powders. (laughs) So I wanted to get it into a capsule form and I was taking all these disgusting green blends as well things like spirulina and chlorella barley grass juice extract and so it was really just a similar thing a a pet project a personal project I want to put something together and do a formula and yeah it worked really well it continues to work really well our main two supplements are yoga body stretch which is my sort of proprietary yoga supplement for yoga students connective tissue health is really what it works on and then i have a b12 supplement and b12 is nothing uh difficult to find for most people but ours is additive free and it's particularly delicious and so people once they order it they, they it's the one that they want to keep taking most b12 supplements are sort of disgusting (laughs) <laughs> yeah, I, I, it's. I think it's important that um, uh, well, B twelve, especially, especially a lot of yoga teachers are vegan, and um, the two seem to go hand in hand most a lot of the time. And um, if you B twelve is obviously a supplement that is uh, very important if you're on that diet. As a yoga teacher, someone who travels around a lot, and you're on, on you're on the road. You, I meet loads of yoga teachers that eat quite poorly, actually, um, and then they're sick and they need to get cover for the classes. So I do think there's loads of value in being able to ha- have um, supplements that can help them to, to be healthier. Because when you think about it, really, your body is so important when you're doing a job like this. Um, I mean, if, if you're if you're sick, then you're 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 useless, <laughs> basically, yeah. um, for one of a better word. Um, in terms of the, uh, so that brings me on to the, the the other business venture that interested me was Absolute Yoga Academy. So this is a, a teacher training at school that you have um, in a few countries around the world. Is that, um, you, so what's, what's the status of that at the moment? Yeah, so we, our uh, 2017 was our last year and we had a, um, let's see, I started in 2006, so... 2006 to 2017, so yeah, 11 year run and something like 2,500 graduates all over the world. So, a really great run. We were based in Thailand. I lived in Thailand myself for a number of years. And I started this training program out of the back of my first yoga studio in Thailand. And uh, yeah, just had a really amazing run. All kinds of different courses. Hot yoga was always kind of our main focus. And we had vinyasa courses, ashtanga courses, acro courses, all kinds of different things. And Thailand was always our home base, but we also had courses in Holland, and we also had courses in the Philippines, and it was a huge, huge project. And and these days we're kind of shifting and making a different focus, focusing here on Europe and focusing on on a different style of training. Yoga is always a, a moving target, and things have really changed pretty dramatically in terms of how yoga is taught, what yoga teachers need, and just the, the landscape of, of the yoga community in general has really shifted. And so over the past couple of years, I put all of my focus into a, a much more long form intensive style program that we call the Yoga Teachers College. But uh, that, was, that was the brief history of, of Absolute Yoga Academy, which is a really um, one, of, one of the biggest achievements, I guess, of my career is, is training all those teachers. 
Okay, so you, but you, now you've re- rebranded it and you're going to have it a more intensive. Yeah, I wouldn't say we've rebranded it because everything we do now is completely different. We just did a 180 shift and uh, completely different okay. completely different company, completely different project, but uh, still training teachers, but in a very, very different way. Much more fitness focused, much more business positive, much more uh, empowering people to really work outside of studios, not just inside. That was the biggest shift, you know, when I first trained teachers, all of our graduates went to work in studios. Now, uh, less than half of them do. And usually the ones that are working in studios, they're also working many other places. They're working at home, they're working in fitness centers, schools, elder care facilities. We have a lot of people doing fusion teaching where they're massage therapists. And they're also a yoga teacher. They are a psychotherapist and a yoga teacher. So the market's changed really dramatically. And we got really excited about catering towards the future of yoga not the past of yoga and the past of yoga has going gone away quickly and going away very very quickly so it's a it's been a really exciting change for us okay yeah and you made a a really good point there in terms of um business advice when i did my 300 hours which i'm halfway through now with bryce every day there was a section on business and how to think like a business person think like an entrepreneur which is so important um you can't just go around teaching classes you need to think um what you know what the next step is for you as a self-employed person so i found massive value in that and i used to listen to your uh, the business mastery podcast that you had as well um are you still making episodes will you still be making episodes of that because you haven't done one for a while is that something you plan to do i hope more of <laughs> yeah, yeah, I hope to. You know, that I, 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 I don't even remember why we did that. I think we had a bunch of trainees in town or something. Anyway, it was just kind of a, a, a I, I wanted to do it as a fixed series. So I thought I'd do 12 or 15 shows or something and then just see how it went. Right. And I made the, we did all these really, really fast. And we put them out and I didn't really think anyone was listening. And I checked my stats and we actually have quite a few people listening. So I, I hope to revive it. Um, it's surprisingly hard to get people on the phone. They're a little bit, people are a little bit shy about talking. So that's the biggest barrier. People will send me 12 emails a day. But in terms of getting people on the phone, yoga teachers on the phone, it's a little bit challenging. But yeah, I hope to do like a, maybe a second series or something like that. I was really excited to see that people were getting value out of it. So uh, yeah, we, we have quite a lot of listeners and even some good reviews and stuff. So I don't do a good job. I, I don't do any job at promoting or telling anyone about it. So I, I, I will for sure loop around and come back to that at some point. Yeah, I think there's, I think there's massive value in it um, personally. Um, so in terms of because you you have so I said you have so many business ventures and you seem to um, be um, ahead of the curve in terms of what the next thing is. Uh, what would you say is the next um, big thing in yoga or in the industry? The thing that or how do you see the industry going? Yeah, if that means, I mean, the thing that I'm excited about is regulation. And most yoga teachers are totally anti this, but I'm the opposite. I think that we our industry needs regulation, and it's coming. Mm-hmm. It's coming all over the world in different ways, but uh, probably local regulation. So in some cases, counties, province, states. So here in Catalonia, there there is an existing yoga sort of accreditation by Catalonia, which is the province. It's kind of a mess, but I think it'll get better. In India, they're working on government-backed accreditations. In the U.S. and a number of states, they're working on it. The analogy I always use is massage therapy in in some places completely unregulated, in some places super regulated. Wherever it's regulated heavily, it's better. People get paid more, they get covered by insurance, better work conditions, lots of public sector jobs. So I'm really all for regulation and I'm excited about that. The industry is a free for all right now. When I interview people, people come in with quote unquote certificates and some of them literally can't hold a sentence together and others of them are total pros and so there's no quality standard whatsoever in the industry right now and the general quality and the general working knowledge is piss poor it's so so shockingly bad that i'm really excited about uh new standards i'm excited about um a a much bigger barrier to entry becoming a yoga teacher now is something that people do they sort of take a trip to bali and become a yoga teacher and and they go back to work and it, it it kind of makes the whole industry a little bit silly you don't find this in Pilates you don't find this in personal training even even these industries which are less regulated are still taken a lot more seriously than yoga teachers so I think the future is regulation I think the future is a lot of public sector jobs um, and, and the, the regulation will also force yoga teachers to strip out 
all the neo-Hinduism and all the pseudo-religion stuff that's crept in there, which is really just a lot of cultural appropriation. And it makes it very difficult for people like me who are trying to get yoga into school systems and into hospitals and public sector. It it makes it really difficult when a yoga teacher who is some random Judeo-Christian background, 23-year-old comes in and starts doing Hindu chants. It screws it up for everybody because they're not Hindu. They don't know what they're doing, but they didn't, it's completely, nobody has any bad intentions, but it's a, it's a, it's, a, it's, it's making it really difficult for, for yoga to get, a, to, to move into public sector, schools, elder care facilities, hospitals, when you don't have any kind of quality control. And a lot of what's going on is sort of spiritual tourism, spiritual kitsch. And it, it's, it doesn't really have anything to do with moving yoga from, what was, uh, you know, 100 years ago, kind of a freaks and geeks practice to something that's mainstream mind, body, health. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's, um, I didn't realize the way you put it, the, the impact, that's a really good uh, analogy about the massage industry. Um, so, um, yeah, I think there's, there's a lot of value in that because, as you said, it can, you can become a yoga teacher in four weeks now, you, you know, uh, or just go hop on a plane and come back and you're a teacher. Um, so with that in mind, and I'll leave my, my final question is, um, what would you say is the next business venture for yoga body or, or the growth area? You know, I, I've really been doing the same thing for, uh, over a decade and, um, Really, when it comes down to it, I'm an educator, and that's really what I get most excited about. And uh, my, myself and my company, we educate in a few different areas, but primarily teaching, yoga teaching, yoga business, and nutrition. Those are kind of the biggest areas that we focus on. And so how that actually pans out, I don't really care. Like, I think I'll be podcasting for a while, but if for some reason uh, the my, my subscribers and my listeners need me to move to video, I'll figure that out. If somehow people would prefer if I move back to mostly writing, I'll figure that out. But in at its essence, really what I want to do is educate people. Well, Lucas, um, thanks so much for your time. I know you're a busy man. And uh, thanks for all the education that I've received via your podcast, um, The Yoga Talk Show. I highly recommend it to anyone who's into yoga and likes listening to podcasts. Um, yeah, so uh, thanks a lot for speaking with me. Thanks for having me, Kevin. Well, that's all from Lucas. hope you enjoyed the episode and learned as much as I did. Next week I have with me Brian O'Loughlin of Movement 101. Brian is an expert in the area of mobility and if you're a yoga practitioner, a yoga teacher, mobility is becoming more and more popular. So I really recommend tuning for that episode. Brian is also a really fun guy so it should be a good one. Um, As always, if you enjoy the podcast, enjoy the episodes, please leave me a review on iTunes or Stitcher. Hope you have a good few days and I'll speak to you next week. Bye.